The code you see here introduces configurability for the persistence of an app. It allows us to choose between different stores and loaders. And this works. Until it doesn't. Only one tiny change and we're in trouble. So actually the way this app is made flexible is a huge problem. Let's see how this unfolded. We started with good intentions. Make the app flexible by allowing different persistence objects. But along the way we built something that invites misconfiguration. In this video we will see how we ended up here and how the abstract factory pattern can fix the problem. And if you already know about the abstract factory pattern, then stick around anyways, because we'll discuss different ways to implement this in Rust and discuss the trade-offs. It all started with this little app. Nothing fancy, just hard-coded JSON persistence. Need to store something, it goes to JSON. Need to load something, also JSON. No choices, no surprises. You know, there is no need to over-engineer things in advance. So, someday the requirement came in. Could you make this work with SQL persistence as well? Sure, no problem. We just need to make it flexible. So, we created two traits, storer and loader, and made our app generic over both. That way, we can plug in any storer and loader we like. Of course, this came with some changes to our impl block and our constructor method. But it worked perfectly, it seems. But here's the catch. We didn't just add flexibility. We added too much flexibility. Now we can do this, which technically compiles, but makes no sense at all. We allow the configuration in which the store and loader work on different media, which leads to undesired behavior. So, this begs the question, is there a way we can leverage the compiler such that misconfigurations can never happen? Well, if I'm asking like that, you already know the answer. Of course there is. And it is a classic. The abstract factory pattern. Let's take a look at what it is, how to use it, and how it can solve this very problem. The point where the misconfiguration can happen is our constructor method takes two separate objects, a storer and a loader. The crux is that the types of the storer and the loader, S and L, are not connected at all. This is what allows us to use a JSON storer together with a SQL loader. What we want is to establish a connection between those two types, such that only a consistent configuration is possible. One way to do this is by creating a container around the storer and loader, and letting this container manage the types. We would of course then have to hand the whole container to our constructor to prohibit individual configuration of storer and loader. For example, a JSON persistent struct would hold a JSON storer and a JSON loader, which is a consistent configuration. And similar for a SQL persistence. But you've probably already noticed that by handing concrete types to our constructor, we've set ourselves back to square one. The configuration is hard-coded once again. But in Rust there's almost no problem that can't be fixed with traits. Instead of taking a concrete type as a parameter to the constructor method, we can make the method generic over a type f, which is constrained to implement a new trait called factory. The factory trait itself is generic over the same types s and l which the app needs, i.e. a storer and a loader. And it declares two factory methods to create those. This gives us back configurability, but with the constraint that we can only introduce consistent sets of storer and loader, which is exactly what we wanted. Of course, this is only true if the implementing structs of the factory trade are consistent themselves. This, however, is way easier to check than making sure that each individual use of a storer and a loader aligns. We can now easily see where the pattern got its name from. It is a factory because it creates objects, and it is abstract because we want to use it behind the trade to leverage polymorphism. The main use case is to allow for coherent change of a family of objects which belong together. In our case, these are the storer and the loader. And it is quite apparent that the usage of a factory significantly reduces the method parameters, especially when the number of objects it creates increases. So, this is the core concept. I use generics to showcase how things work in principle. But it wouldn't be rust if there weren't at least a gazillion other ways to do things. And the actual implementation does matter. So, let's hop into part 2 of this video, where we'll take a look at some of those variants and talk about their trade-offs. First, let's see the full code of the abstract factory relying on generics. 
On the left hand side you can see the code that makes up the factory while the consuming app is on the right hand side. The trade is exactly as we just discussed with the two generic types S and L restricted to implement storer and loader respectively. The JSON factory struct implements the factory trade. Here S and L are specified to be the concrete types JSON storer and JSON loader. For brevity I left out the obvious SQL implementations. On the consumer side we see that the app is also generic over the same types S and L. The constructor method becomes a bit unwieldy though. It introduces an additional generic type F which needs to implement the factory trade generic over S and L. This solution works and is really performant due to static dispatch of both the factory and the created objects. Readability suffers though from all the generic types, which only gets worse the more configurable services the app has. Let us now go to the close relative of the generic abstract factory, which is the associated type abstract factory. Here the trade doesn't need to define any generic type parameters. Instead it defines the return types of the factory methods via associated type, hence the name. Of course these are restricted by the store and loader trade again. The implementing JSON factory defines those associated types to be the JSON store and the JSON loader. Note that opposed to the generic abstract factory, only a single implementation of the trade is allowed per struct. This is probably what you want anyways for a factory as the set of returned objects are uniquely defined. So I see this as an advantage. In order to leverage the performance benefits of static dispatch, the app is generic over S and L again, and the constructor is very similar. Only the signature changes slightly, but it's still not easy on the eyes. Overall, I prefer this solution slightly over the generic abstract factory because of the unique trade implementation per struct as just discussed. Now let's take a jump and move to an implementation which returns boxed trade objects. The factory trade simplifies quite nicely due to the dynamic dispatch syntax, but in the implementation of the factory methods we see that there is of course a price to pay. Allocation on the heap. However, readability of the app also improves as it now stores boxed trade objects. And the only generic type parameter in this implementation is that of the factory. You could get rid of it by putting it behind a trade object as well though. Your decision. As you can see from the small footprint, readability improved drastically compared to the two previous versions. However, we are taking a performance hit due to dynamic dispatch and especially due to heap allocation of the returned objects. Depending on how your application uses these objects, this can be anywhere from absolutely detrimental to totally okay. Let me close this implementation by saying that the dynamic dispatch does open up the possibility for runtime polymorphism of objects which are not known at compile time. Think of plugin architectures for example. And on we go to our next contender. This one is quite new to Rust as it requires returning an impl object from a trade method. This allows us to have static dispatch while having a syntax similar to dynamic dispatch. The implementation of the trade also looks really clean. And in order to keep aligned with static dispatch, we use the generic version of our app. The constructor is also straightforward and simple, so we're quite hyped that we found an outstanding solution here. It seems to be the best of both worlds in terms of performance and readability. That is, until we find out that this doesn't compile. Rust can't connect the impulse storer and loader returned from the factory to the types S and L that our app is generic over. That's because the values returned from the factory have opaque types. The compiler knows what they are but it doesn't reveal that information to the caller. Meanwhile, S and L need to be fully known at compile time so the app can be monomorphized. In other words, the factory is hiding the exact types, but the app needs to know them. And since there's no one in the type system to connect those dots, the compiler can't match them up. So what can we do to get out of our misery? You guessed it, we can box the return types to create trade objects on the heap. And there goes our performance. But give me a second, it gets even worse. If no lifetime annotations exist, Rust requires boxed objects to be static. And the way we return objects from the factory guarantees nothing in terms of lifetime. So to not restrict all of our generated objects to be static, we need to introduce a generic lifetime A for our factory and spread it all over the implementation. Isn't that just so beautiful? 
what seemed like the perfect solution has morphed into an inefficient lifetime abomination. Anyways, let's get on to a more edifying variant, an implementation based on enums. Instead of traits, we create an enum for the storer, which has one variant for each persistence type, and same for the loader. Note that the enum variants store the respective implementation. The factory itself is also an enum, which implements the factory methods via match statements on the own variant type. The app definition is as clean as it's gonna get. This also holds true for the constructor. Overall, this is a very idiomatic solution. It features nice readability and good performance through static dispatch. The main downside here is the memory overhead for storing enums, especially when they differ strongly in size. If this factory is part of a library, you should also be aware that adding an additional variant in any of the enums will break downstream code, because match statements need to be exhaustive. This is not a problem with the trade-based implementations. Let us now see a final comparison of these five implementations. The abstract factory implemented purely in terms of generics features top-notch performance, but lacks in readability because of all the generic type parameters. The closely related version based on associated types is mostly on par, with the small upside of restricting us to one trait implementation, which is probably what we want anyways. Returning box trait objects from the factory does cost us in terms of performance, but makes the code simpler and easier to read. Additionally, it enables runtime polymorphism. Returning objects via the impl trait syntax turned out to be a horrible idea. The hypothetical gain in performance through static dispatch for returned factory objects is erased by the need to box these into trade objects on the consumer side. Overall, this implementation might be very confusing to any reader due to this mixing between static and dynamic dispatch. And finally, the idiomatic solution based on enums. Aside from a slight memory overhead, it features great performance and offers nice readability on top. The aforementioned risk of breaking downstream code by adding enum variants might be a deal breaker though, if you include it in a library trade. I personally find myself reaching for the box trade object solution most of the time, especially early on in projects. This is because I value readability over almost anything else. And let's be honest, lots of applications don't take a large hit from the dynamic dispatch anyways, because they are I.O. bound. Only if I see that the design has settled and performance is king, I will reach for the associated type pattern. It's just my personal preference over generics and enums, nothing more. And there we go, another way too long video about an actually not so complicated design pattern. But anyways, you've made it to the end, so if you're interested in more content like this, take a look at the videos I made about the visitor and the decorator design pattern. And subscribe if you'd like to stick around for similar content. I hope to see you next time with Green Tea Coding.